Good morning, Gateway! Let's all stand up and get ready to lift our praises to Jesus! Amen. Love Jesus, and today we engage in the fullness of worship to lift your name high because we are alive in you, God. Oh, let there be freshness today as we sing praises to give glory to you. Let's go. I was lost with a broken heart. You picked me up, now I'm set apart. From the ash, I am born again. Forever saved in a saved. Hands. You are more than my words could say. I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days. Make my eyes follow in your ways. Forever free in an ending grace. You are, you are, you are my freedom. We'll lift you higher. We'll lift you higher. Your love, your love, your love never I'm pressing on till I see your face. I believe that your will be done. I won't stop till your kingdom comes. You are, you are, you are my freedom. We'll lift you higher, lift you higher. Your love, your love, your love never ends. of the Lord those who have clean hands and pure hearts the Bible says we encourage church as we come and lift our worship to the Father He sees us as His children thank you Jesus for the opportunity to just come together to lift 
this worship to your throne.
to the Father, fall into grace. Let's lift voice, church. We're done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my home found a friend. So I run to the Father again. as a Christian in this world is the presence of the Lord. Amen. Let's come together in the spirit of worship and just breathe in His presence. The presence of the Lord will not come into this place if we don't just desire it and seek it and ask for heaven to come down. Let's worship Him together, church, with a pure heart. This is my daily 
thank you, Jesus, for always, always faithful in allowing the presence to overwhelm us in this place. Amen. Come on, Gary, give him praise. Thank you for worshiping with us. Please greet your neighbors, the front and the side, before you take your seats. And after that, turn your eyes on the screen. God bless you, Gateway. Good morning, Gateway. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you made the good decision to get up and come to church today. It's the best way to start your week. And if you're a guest with us today, we want to say we are so glad that you are here at Gateway. We pray that you feel so welcome today as you're joining in our service. If you are that guest, we'd love if you do us a favor and fill out what we call a Connect card. You'll find one of those Connect cards under the seat in front of you or on the table at the back of the auditorium. Simply fill it out and drop it in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. If you're here today and you don't have your very own Bible, we don't want you to leave without making sure you have a Bible in your hands. At the end of today's service, you can head to the table at the back of the auditorium where you'll find a friendly face ready to give you your very own Bible. Fall is almost here and maybe that means it's time to make a new routine in your weekly schedule. Why not checking out one of our Connect courses? Starting tomorrow night, Monday at 7 o'clock right here at the church, the series How to Get Through What You're Going Through will be starting facilitated by Donna and Larry Baumgartner. In this series, we talk about the difficulties that come in life, whether it be the loss of a friend or a family member, the loss of a job, a difficult situation within your family, you name it, this course covers how to get through those tough times. So if you want to attend, we ask that you please sign up at the info desk today so we have an idea of how many people are attending. Reminder that starts tomorrow night right here at 7 o'clock. Also on Tuesday night at 7, we have our interactive Bible study facilitated by Wally Adabogan. Wednesday night at 7, we have the keys to the blessed life right here in the auditorium. On Friday night, there's Gateway Youth Movement right here at 7 o'clock. And on Saturday morning at 9.30, there's Expedition Promised Land. And at 2.30, there's the Gateway Prayer Hour by Zoom. Starting on Wednesday, September 28th, right here at 7 o'clock, we will be offering the series called Foundation. In this series, we learn how to build a solid life on God's word and God's promises. So make sure to mark your calendars and come out on Wednesdays, starting September 28th at 7 o'clock, right here at the church. Also, on Friday, September 30th, we are excited to have our next water baptism celebration. So we encourage you to come on out and support and cheer on those that are making that step and being water baptized. Thank you, Gateway, for giving generously into God's house and being obedient to God's word when it says to bring the first tenth of everything that comes into your house back to the local church. You know, by giving into Gateway, you're helping us move church forward right here in Regina and also be generous to our missions commitments. You, many of you know that we support a church in the Philippines and recently some of our donations were helped use to sponsor some of their youth and young adults to head to a youth conference. So thank you Gateway for making that happen for these beautiful young lives. We believe that they were so impacted by attending that conference. There's three ways that you can give today. The first is by giving in person, by dropping your giving in one of the giving boxes. The second is by giving online. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give and follow the prompts. The third way is by text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's appearing on the screen right now and follow the prompts. If you're joining us via church online, now might be a great time for you to duck away and grab yourself a cracker and a juice so you can participate in communion with us at the end of today's service. Now that's all I got for you, Gateway. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you right back here next Sunday. And Pastor Brian, over to you for our next session in our Dare to be a Daniel series. All right. Good morning, Gateway. So good to have you here today. And this is not just any Sunday. This is Communion Sunday. Thank you very much. I got to tell you, this is my favorite church. And you guys are my favorite congregation. And you know I'm going to say the exact same thing to the 1130 crew. <laughs> this is going to be part two of our fall uh, sermon series from the book of Daniel. You know there was one pastor 
who had an extremely busy week and a number of things that came up. And, and, and then next thing you know, it was the end of the week and he still didn't have a sermon prepared. And so Saturday morning rolled around and he is feverishly praying, Lord, I got to have a word. I got to have a word. Lord, give me a word to preach tomorrow morning. And, and next thing you know, Saturday expired and he still didn't have a sermon for Sunday. And he got up early on Sunday morning. He's like, Lord, I got to have a word. Drop something into my heart. I need a word. Wow, the service started there doing the worship, and he's still under his breath saying, Lord, what's the word for today? I gotta have a word. And finally, he felt the Lord spoke to his heart and said, I have a word for you. Oh, thank goodness. What is it, Lord? The Lord said, the word that I have for you is, you should have prepared something. I want you to know, I came prepared this morning. I'm not just going to wing it, all right? Before we get into the book of Daniel, would you stand to your feet? And would you boldly repeat after me, I love God. Therefore, I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow His example. Say, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul. And health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Can you say amen? amen? Come on, somebody give praise to the Lord for the Word of God. Oh, yeah, thank God for His Word, which will never return void. It will always accomplish His purposes. Amen to that. All right. You may be seated, and I want to just take a moment to say a special welcome to those who are watching online. Good to have you with us. You know, going to church is kind of like going to school. How many of you remember back to school days? And if you, if you missed school for a day or two because you were not feeling well or something, you still had to catch up on those assignments that you missed, right? I hope you feel the same way about church now that you're into your adult life, that if for some reason you miss church, that you still want to catch up on what you missed by going online. That's why the Lord said on the eighth day, let there be YouTube. <laughs> right? Okay, for those who are watching online, we pray that you will get well soon. Amen. All right, for this series of messages, I'm borrowing a title from a popular hymn that dates back to 1873, the name of the hymn, Dare to Be a Daniel. Listen, as a person who loves the Lord, when you find yourself in an environment that is anything but Christian, here's the question. Are you determined to stand up for what you believe, or will you somehow sort of try to blend in with the crowd. That's the issue that's on the table here during these weeks. So just turn to your neighbor and say, I double dare you to be a Daniel. <laughs> you know, it was the year 605 B.C., and Israel was kind of spiritually aloof. Their hearts were not toward the Lord, with some exceptions as we see here in the book of Daniel. But the army of Babylon invaded Israel. And they carried away hundreds of Jewish captives, especially the ones who were young men that were really healthy and really intelligent. And, and that was the beginning of the book of the adventures of Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, better known to us as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which was the Babylonian names that were given to them because these, uh, these young men, along with many others, were carried away to the city of Babylon. And there they were enrolled in a three-year-long program of indoctrination into the philosophy of the Babylonian Empire. And so they were being trained to become officials in, government, in, the, in the government of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so last week in Daniel chapter 1, we saw that these young men, they did not go kicking and screaming. In fact, they cooperated with their captors. However, they did not buy in to the Babylonian belief system. Folks, Daniel and his three associates, they stayed true to their faith in the God of Israel. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, they were given Babylonian names. 
And those names represented Babylonian gods. But all the while, these four young men stayed absolutely 100% faithful to their Jewish identity. They knew who they were, and they knew who their God was. You see, as those young Israelites were living in the foreign culture of the beautiful city of Babylon, likewise, for you and I, as New Testament believers, our Christianity is a subculture in the midst of a predominantly non-Christian secular culture that's all around us. And, and just like Daniel and company, we've got to know who we are in Christ and stay totally loyal to our Lord. Somebody say amen. Come on, everybody say, I, I identify as a follower of Jesus. Come on, let's say a little bit more bolder than that. I identify as a follower of Jesus. Amen. If that's you, come on, give yourself a hand. That's a powerful thing. Got to know who you are. Today, I want to look at Daniel chapter 3. This is where we find one of the most famous stories in the entire Old Testament. It's the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Or as one father used to say to his children when it would come time for him to read from the Bible bedtime storybook, sometimes he would say, okay, kids, tonight I'm going to read to you the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed you go. <laughs> so I'm not going to read the entire chapter. It's a long one, but I will read some excerpts. But the emphasis of today's message that I want you to be watching for in this chapter is this. As we serve God in this secular culture, we will most certainly experience both favor and disfavor. So we're going to have favor with God and favor with man, and we are also going to run into some disfavor. Not disfavor with God, but for sure we will experience some disfavor with people. In other words, there are some people that are going to take a liking to you, and some people are going to take a disliking to you. You want to be in this Christian outfit? You're going to have to have some thick skin. Okay, so in this chapter, be on the lookout for favor slash disfavor. Are you ready? We're going to pick it up in the last couple of verses of chapter 2 because in chapter 2, that's where Nebuchadnezzar had a very disturbing dream, and Daniel was able to interpret the dream for him, and so Daniel was very handsomely rewarded for being able to do that. So here we go. Chapter 2, verse 48. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Everybody say, now that's favor. You could say that Daniel and his three friends were among King Nebuchadnezzar's favorites. But in chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar commissioned his craftsmen to build a huge golden image. It was a monument, really, to Nebuchadnezzar himself. The thing was 90 feet tall. Think in terms of a nine-story high tower. Okay, you got that in your mind? This thing is massive, and it's golden. And so they, they made a decree. They, they made a, a law. Everyone must bow down and worship the image or else. Or else what? Or else you will be burned alive in the incinerator. And so the announcement is made, and there's a huge gathering, and all the officials are there, thousands of them, and no doubt many other people from the Babylonian public as well, and the band is playing, and it is a grand unveiling ceremony for this golden image. And everyone knelt down and they bowed in allegiance to the king except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story, right? Now, some of them may say, what about Daniel? 
Where was Daniel when all of this was going on? Strangely, there's no mention of Daniel whatsoever in Daniel chapter 3. So presumably he was out of the country on state business or something. But you know for sure, 100%, if Daniel had been there, he would not have bowed down either. Somebody say amen. How well do you know Daniel? And so the fact is, on principle, these young men, they would not bow down. Verse 8 says this, At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. Everybody say, that's disfavor. Yeah, not only disfavor, it sounds like anti-Semitism to me as well. But if you read between the lines, those guys that made this charge against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were jealous of those guys. Yeah, why, why? Those stargazers, they were the ones that ratted out the Jews. What's going on? Verse 9 says this, They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Do I detect a little buttering up of the king? Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, and, and the lyre, and, and <laughs> I can just about hear King Nebuchadnezzar saying, all right, all right, I know all of that. Get to the point. And so in verse 12, Your Highness, there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to be exact. And these guys pay no attention to you, Your Majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Sir, when the music played, those three did not bow down. Now, at that point, King Nebuchadnezzar should have said, how do you know? If you guys were bowed down, how do you know they didn't? Right? It's like a family that was sitting down at the supper table one night, and, and so dad prayed to give thanks for the food. And, and then when he finished praying, his little girl said, Daddy, Johnny didn't have his eyes closed when you were praying. And dad said, how do you know, darling? Right? He should have said, how do you know? But he didn't. Here's his response in verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these uh, men were, were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, you know, next time, and the flute and the zither and the lyre and the harp and pipe and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, then very good. But if you do not worship it, you know what will happen. You'll be thrown into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to save you from my hand? Everybody say, that's favor. Some of you are thinking, what do you mean that's favor? That doesn't sound like favor. That's favor. Clearly, King Nebuchadnezzar is giving them another chance. They're getting another shot at this. Nebuchadnezzar did not say, what's this I hear that you guys didn't bow down to the golden image? Off to the furnace you go. No, he didn't say that. He said, listen, guys, there must be some misunderstanding here. When you hear the music, you must bow down, okay? The way it actually reads in this chapter here, he's given them another chance. Chance, how very un Nebuchadnezzar like. Why is he cutting these guys some slack? Because those three young men were on King Nebuchadnezzar's good side. He favored them. He didn't want to throw them into the furnace. They were some of his best men. He said, Fellas, when the music plays, just simply Bow down, okay, and all will be forgiven. It's all good, and we'll all go home happy tonight, except for maybe the, for those sour grapes astrologers, the ones that turned you in. But in verse 16, these young men, well, I say young men. At this stage, they were in their early 30s. But from where I sit, that's young men. <laughs> so verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, with all due respect, sir, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it, and He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if our God does not deliver us, 
We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was seriously furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude, note this, his attitude toward them changed from favor to disfavor. He ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Come on, everybody say, that's definitely disfavor. Down in verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. We may not have been able to interpret your dream, but we can count to three. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth one looks like a son of the gods. I wonder who that could be. Any guesses? (laughs) Of course, it was Jesus himself. You know, in theology, this is known as a theophany. There's a handful of places in the Old Testament where you find a guest appearance of Jesus back in the Old Testament, not the least of which is this one right here. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace. He got as close as he could, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God. All right, you win. Come out. Come here. Notice he didn't say, and you there, the fourth guy, whoever you are, Mr. Angel, come, I want to meet you too. (laughs) Didn't say that. But the Bible does say, not even the smell of smoke on their clothes. No third hand smoke. That is so cool. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree, I'm going to make a new law right here and now that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses will be turned into piles of rubble uh, for no other God can save in this way. He says, anyone, I'm making a law, anyone who makes any disparaging remarks against the God of Israel, and that includes those snakes. Verse 30 says, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Everybody say, that's favor. No kidding. And when Daniel got back to town, they're like, Daniel, have we got a story for you to include in your memoirs? Folks, in this series, we're talking about maintaining our faith in God in the midst of a non-Christian society, or in some respects, an anti-Christian society. Isn't it true? But the point of today's message is this. You will experience both favor and disfavor if you hang around for any length of time in the non-Christian community, and basically there's no getting away from it. I mean, you'd have to live on a different planet. You're going to live in this world. You're going to face some resistance from the non-Christian community. We see repeatedly in the book of Daniel that, that these young guys who stayed true to the Lord, they had favor and also disfavor. Remember last week in chapter 1, Daniel was respectful. He politely protested the diet. Remember that? He was not rude. He was not defiant. I'm not eating your food. No, no. He had a very winsome spirit. In fact, Ashpenaz, which was the man who was put in charge of training up these young Hebrew fellows, he really liked Daniel. In verse 9 of chapter 1, it says, Now God had caused the official, Ashpenaz, to show favor and compassion to Daniel. He liked him. And King Nebuchadnezzar himself was so impressed with Daniel and his three friends that he promoted them, gave them very high positions. That's favor. Later on in the series, we'll see the same thing. In Daniel chapter 6, 
Daniel had the very same effect on King Darius. And now that's when King Nebuchadnezzar was out of the picture and his successor, one of his successors was King Darius. And, and Darius liked Daniel. The last thing he wanted to do was throw him to the lions, but he was tricked into it. By who? Who else? Daniel's antagonist. Why? Why would anybody be against Daniel? What's not to like about this outstanding man, Daniel? Well, how about his faith in God? That's the only thing that they could hold against him. Listen, if you represent the Lord, some people will like you. Some will dislike you. You know, years ago, Dr. Billy Graham, the evangelist, was, was playing golf in a celebrity golf tournament. And he was grouped with, uh, with, there was a threesome of men. So it's evangelist Billy Graham, and the second guy was a... a he was a professional golfer. He was on the PGA Tour. And, and the third guy, if I recall correctly, was from Hollywood. And so they went out and they had their round of golf. And when they finished up their round of golf, the professional golfer guy hadn't had a particularly good round of golf. And so he was a little bit upset. And, and when they came off the course, one of the media people got in the face of this, this PGA golfer and said, so how did it go out there? And, and he kind of mumbled a few things and he said, he said, if I want to play around the golf, I don't need Billy Graham shoving religion down my throat. And at that point, the guy from Hollywood kind of laughed and he said, listen, I was with those two men the whole time. Billy never said anything to him about the Lord. <laughs> What's the point? Some people will be annoyed with you just because of who you represent and what you represent. You see, when we make that personal decision, to believe and receive Jesus as our Savior. You know, when you hear the simple terms of the gospel and, and you come to understand the, the necessity of the cross, because at first we're thinking, why would the Son of God have to die the death of a heinous criminal on the old rugged cross. That doesn't sound right. It's because Jesus volunteered for the job. He was assuming the penalty for the sins of all humanity. He was a sacrificial lamb so that we could be off the hook. That's why Jesus went to the cross. And when we get that and when we make that personal decision to say, Lord, what am I waiting for? Yes, please come and invade my life with your saving grace. I admit, I need you. I need to be spiritually reborn. And when we make that intelligent decision to become a bona fide follower of Christ, it's not just forgiveness of sin. It's not just the promise of, of heaven later on, but there's all kinds of, of wonderful things that, that belong to us. We can, we can have a rich and rewarding experience as followers of Jesus. One of the things that you, that you will experience as, as, a, as a, a member of the family of God is that now, as a Christian, you make a whole bunch of new friends. Somebody say amen. amen. But the accompanying truth is you will also make some new enemies. Oh, boy. <laughs> Listen to the Gospel of John, chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. If the world, now this is Jesus speaking. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. But if they obey my teaching, they will also receive your teaching in my name. Listen, some people will treat you favorably. Others will be downright nasty because you have identified yourself as a Christian. Have you discovered this? How many times have you been around the block? <laughs> See, in Luke Chapter 9 and 10, remember when Jesus sent out the 12? And then further to that, he sent out the 70 in pairs. He sent them out to do door-to-door -door witnessing. And he was straight up with them. Jesus warned them ahead of time. He said, now listen, this is what you can expect. There's going to be some people that you reach out to that will be very receptive. And so you speak blessing on them. But there's other people that will reject what you're trying to tell them. And so those people, you just shake the dust off your feet and continue on to the next place. There's going to be favor, but there will also be some disfavor. 
Remember the two thieves that hung on the crosses on either side of Jesus. One of them spoke to Jesus with words of disfavor and disrespect, but the other one put his faith in the Lord before it was too late. Listen, if you identify as a Christian, some people will be for you and some will be against you. Get over it. This is the fact that comes with the territory of of Christianity. It's It's a hard truth to receive. Why? Because this truth, it goes against a deeply rooted human nature that says, I want everybody to like me. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. That's not how it is. If you try to get everybody to like you, you become neurotic. This is not realistic. Jesus said so. How many of you recall back in school learning Aesop's fables? Come on, let me see your hand. You remember Aesop's fables? Do you remember the one that was called the bat and the birds and the beasts? Remember that fable? Let me just jog your memory. Here's how it goes. One day the bat was hanging around in a tree. You know how bats do. They, hung, they hang up, upside down. And so the bat is, is in the tree. And, and, and as it turns out, the birds were set to go to war against the beasts. There was some difference of opinion between the two groups. And, and, and so here's the bat in the tree. And some of the birds came along, and as the birds flew by, they said to the bat, come and join us. We're going to fight against the beasts. And, and the bat said, well, no, I, I can't do that because I'm not a bird. I'm a beast. And then shortly later, some of the beasts came by underneath the tree and they looked up and they saw the bat and they said, come and join us. We're going to war against the birds. And and the bat said, well, I I can't do that because I'm not a beast. I'm a bird. See, look at my wings. Well, as it turned out, in due course of time, the beasts and the birds came to an understanding and they did not go to war with each other. And then the bat went to join the the birds to celebrate the peace. And the birds didn't want to have anything to do with him because earlier on he claimed not to be a bird. And so he went to join the beasts in their celebration party. And the beasts also didn't want to have anything to do with him because earlier on he had claimed that he was not a beast. And they, they said, get away from us. And the moral of the fable is this. He that is neither one thing nor the other has no friends. You can't ride the fence. No wonder people don't like bats, huh? (laughs) Listen, if you are a Bible-believing, church-attending, clean-living, born-again Christian, living in the midst of a predominantly non-Christian secular culture, try not to act too surprised if sometimes people give you a dirty look. Come on, have you been there? May I offer you a few points and, and pointers regarding favor slash disfavor. Can you handle a few points this morning? You know, there was one pastor who was preaching his sermon one Sunday morning, and it was a multi-point sermon. At one point, he said, and seventeenthly, when it was all done, he felt a little bit bad. So the following Sunday, he showed mercy. He got up to preach, and, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be happy to know that today's sermon is pointless. I want to give you some points. Here we go. Number one is this, and I won't give you 17 of them. If we are to have what the Bible calls favor with man, that would be the Lord's doing, but it also has something to do with how we conduct ourselves. Yeah, have you ever had this experience that you heard somebody say something like this? Man, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I, I feel like I should give it to you for a ridiculously low price. In fact, I just give it to you. You don't even have to pay me. <laughs> ever had somebody say that and, and they have no idea why they are giving you a big break? But all the while, you know why, because the Lord is prompting them to show you some favor. I'm I'm pretty sure we've all had some experiences like that, right? Just like Daniel in Daniel chapter 1, verse 9. It says that God caused Ashpenaz to show favor to Daniel. 
It's not wrong to pray for favor. It's right to pray for favor. Lord, I believe that I have favor with you, and therefore I believe that I have favor with man. Thank you, Lord, for causing people to do me favors and to open doors of opportunity for me. Lord, I am on the lookout for divine favor flowing through human vessels as I walk my walk today. Pray for divine favor, and you will receive it. But listen, on the other part of the equation, so divine favor is God touching people's hearts so that they will be nice to you. That's God doing His part. But on the other hand, because you are such an easy-to-get-along-with person, because you have such a, a genuine uh, spirit of pleasantness, because you are a person of integrity, because you are trustworthy, because you are a person that people find really likable, they will show you favor because of your Christian character. Very often that has been the case. So if you experience favor, God has something to do with that, but you also have something to do with that by the way you carry yourself among others. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two is this. If you experience disfavor, this, is, this one's actually a question. Somebody shows you some disfavor, will you handle it well or badly? For example, you ever received a promotion in your workplace? And frankly, you were pleasantly surprised. Man, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. I, I don't know why I got that promotion, but I'll take it. Thank you very much. Have you ever been pleasantly surprised when you were promoted in your place of work? And all you could attribute it to is divine favor working on your behalf. Thank you, Jesus. But what I want to know is, if you get passed over for a promotion, like somebody else got the position that you felt you were in line for and, and you had the credentials, you got the qualifications and, and you're thinking, man, that should have been my job. I should have been elevated to that position. How come the other guy got promoted and I didn't? I wonder with a little, uh, you know, just uh, introspection, I wonder if it could have something to do with the fact that you are a professing Christian in your workplace. I wonder, could it have something to do with your faith? What is your response? You going to have a tantrum right there in your workplace? Or wait till you get home? <laughs> I believe that if you carry yourself with grace, if you handle it well, if you keep your eyes on the Lord and you continue to maintain a positive spirit in whatever environment you're in, I believe that favor is coming your way. So you got passed over. Don't be grumbling about it. You be praising the Lord. Favor is coming your way. Come on, everybody say, favor is coming my way. Favor is coming my way. Say, it's just around the corner. Just around the corner. Say, the Lord is looking out for me. I'll be okay. I'm not getting upset. There will be disfavor. I get that. Yeah. Favor is coming your way. I believe that with you. All right, number three. The good thing about letting people know where you stand is that you will soon know where they stand, which might be a good thing. Or it might be a bad thing. It could be favorable or it could be unfavorable. You know, over the years, I have noticed something quite interesting. There's a, a few different times that I've experienced this, that when I was doing business with people, you know, it's the gas station, it's the convenience store, it's, it's the cashier at the grocery store, whoever it is. You are a regular customer, and so you, you engage, and you just... You know, you're, you're, you're just warm and pleasant. You're friendly, and, and they're warm and pleasant, and, and they're friendly, and you just enjoy having that connect with, with that person. Maybe this lady that always, uh, you know, just checks out your stuff. She's just Miss Congeniality. But when they find out that I'm a Christian, when they find out I'm a pastor, something changes. And now all of a sudden I come in and they're a little bit cool. They're a little bit indifferent. From then on, you know, once they know who I am, wow, they're, they're prepared to just skip the pleasantries and it's all business. There you go. That'll be 
Wow. What's going on? I walk out the door and I think to myself, they probably think I'm a gay basher. They probably think I'm this. They probably think I'm that. Yeah. That's what they probably think. Because when they see you as a born-again Christian, oh, yeah, those people are so judgmental. They're a bunch of hypocrites. They're this and they're that. And that may very well be their sentiment. Their sentiment might change toward you when they find, but you know where they stand now. And they know where you stand because you're standing up for who you are and you are not compromising on your Christian convictions. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, let me give you a couple more quick points here. Number four is this. If someone does express disfavor, that's not necessarily their final answer. People's opinion are subject to change. If somebody finds out that you're a Christian and so they despise you either secretly in their heart or maybe even openly to your face, when they get to know you, they might change their mind. I'm sure it's happened many, many times that in due course of time. At first, they, when they found out you're a Christian, they're like, get away from me. But over the course, as they have dealings with you, as they have occasion to converse with you and begin to watch you and see the demonstration of your Christian character, it could very well be that in due time, they will have a change of heart toward you. And they will begin to warm up to you and maybe even warm up to the Lord that you represent. Things can change. Here in Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar went from extreme disfavor, throw them in the oven, all the way over to extreme favor. The God of Israel is the most high God. Yeah, he changed his tune, didn't he? Shadrach, can I start coming over to your home church? Can I bring my wife with me? Because if she comes along, for sure, she'll be bringing some fresh cinnamon buns. Everybody say, that's favor. <laughs> you see, people's sentiment can change. you got to love Proverbs 16, verse 7. Here's what it says. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Oh, the Lord can do a deep work in somebody's heart. So if somebody initially shows you some obvious disfavor, don't write them off. Keep praying for them. Finally, number five, not 17thly, but fifthly and finally, if people are favorably impressed with you and your brand of Christianity, that's a good thing. But... Your greatest objective of all is that they would be favorably impressed with your God, which is exactly what we see here with King Nebuchadnezzar. He drafted new legislation for Pete's sake. He said, from now on, from now on, we're going to acknowledge the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and nobody is allowed to speak against them. And Nebuchadnezzar is, is extolling the power of a God that could deliver these men from the fire. Oh, my goodness. Come on, keep pressing in and believing the Lord to demonstrate signs and wonders. May there be a miraculous anointing of the Holy Spirit unleashed in every one of our lives, in our homes, in our workplaces, wherever we go. May the power of God be operating in us and through us. Somebody say amen. Because when this happens, people will wake up. People who need the Lord will sit up and take notice of the fact that, wow, that guy's God means business. That guy's Lord is real, and he is a life-changing Savior. Maybe I should take him up on that uh, invitation to go to church with him. Yes, sir. Listen, if you live a godly life, in an ungodly environment. Guaranteed, you will experience favor and disfavor. You know my dear wife, Barb, sitting right here in the front row. Originally, you know, she was trained as a psychiatric nurse. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, but don't say it, okay? Be nice to me. Be nice to me. But I'll tell you what. She first worked in a hospital in her role as a psychiatric nurse and then, and then over at the jail. 
And, and then in due course of time, she applied for a job with social services, along with a couple of hun hundred others that were also applying for two positions that were available. And she knew very well that many of those people had credentials and qualifications that were superior to hers. But guess what? She got the job. She got the job. Everybody say, that's favor. Yeah, right about that same time, she was receiving Jesus as her Savior. And, and a number of months later, she got called into the office, and they sat her down and gave her a kind of a gentle reprimand. They said, now listen, either you stop talking to your clients about Jesus, or we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Okay, they didn't say that, but... They said, you will be looking for a different job if you don't stop talking to your clients about your Jesus. Well, right about that same time, a lady by the name of Vera Lafayette, some of you would know Vera. She was operating a, kind of a, a Christian drop-in center, counseling center, a home over by the General Hospital Sunshine Christian Ministries. And, and she opened the door for Barb to come and live there and, 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 and to, to serve alongside in a counseling capacity and, and to be on staff at, at Sunshine Christian Ministries. And it was just all good. And so she stepped out of one situation right into another situation. And she continued to live there and, and serve there up until the time when we got married and at that point I insisted that she should come and live with me instead and she was agreeable everybody say that's favor absolutely come on there's going to be some favor there's going to be some disfavor but through it all the Lord is going to work remarkably in your life and mine <laughs> do not try to make it your goal to get everybody to like you Come on, we do well to adopt the, uh, the policy of Rick Godwin. He had the SW, SW, SW policy. What is that about? Well, as it relates to, you know, am I going to get everybody to like me or not? SW, SW, SW. Some will, some won't. So what? Next time somebody gives you a hard time because of your faith in Jesus, you just got to know that's par for the course, just let it run off like water runs off a duck's back. Or as somebody said, if they throw tomatoes, take it with a grain of salt. Come on, it's time to celebrate communion this morning. Would you stand to your feet? I've always said communion is about reaffirming our covenant of commitment to the Lord. And, of course, His covenant of committing Himself to us. Folks, every one of us in this room, we will all face situations that beg us to say, I will not bow down. Come on, everybody say, I will not bow down. Yeah, there's going to be times and situations, seasons in your life and mine. There'll be times when somebody needs to say, I will not bow down to that company policy that, that really is, is it, it, it it does not jive with my Christian convictions. I will not bow down to that company policy, or I will not bow down to that school curriculum that does not agree with what God's Word says. I will not bow down to that law of the land that flies in the face of the revealed will of God. I will not bow down to family pressure. I will not bow down to peer pressure. I will not bow down to a religious tradition that will only slow me down spiritually and not help me. I will not bow down to that slave master of addiction. I will not bow down to the spirit of the world. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Now, well, here's what we are going to say. Everybody say, I will bow down to the lordship of Jesus Christ every day of my life. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Do you have your communion kit? Come on, let's pray. Let's pray and acknowledge the saving grace of God. Listen, if you're here in the auditorium today or if you're watching online, if you've never truly turned your life over to Jesus, but you know that you need to right now, the Holy Spirit is touching your heart and you're like, I want in on this. I need to be 
an official follower of Jesus Christ if you know that you need to commit to the Lord or recommit to the Lord so that you can truly celebrate what this communion emblem means to us today. I urge you, join me in this prayer. Come on, let's all pray it together. Maybe you've prayed this prayer many times. Pray it again in a fresh way to say, Jesus, I'm all in to serve you. I will not bow down to the world. I will certainly bow down to the Word of God. Come on, people. Let's pray this together and acknowledge God's saving grace. Dear Jesus, I know you're the Son of God. I believe you died on that cross and you rose from the grave to be a Savior for me, to give me a brand new start. I'm asking you to forgive me for all of my sin. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live the Christian life with bold faithfulness in this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I know you can't clap. You got your communion elements in your hand. Come on. Let's retrieve the wafer. Peel back that little cellophane wrapper. And then, of course, we have the juice as well. My friends, some of you might have seen a movie. It was released in 1966. It was called A Man for All Seasons. It's a story of Sir Thomas More. He was the chancellor of the Church of England. But he would not, he would not pledge allegiance to the crown. Because, of course, the king at the time, King, uh, uh, king uh, Henry VIII, was morally misfit. And Thomas More believed that if he pledged allegiance to the throne, then that would be a betrayal to his allegiance to Jesus Christ. And he would not do it. And therefore, in 1535, he was executed for the position that he took. Now, not likely that somebody's going to come around and decapitate you and I like they did him or throw us in a fiery furnace. But I'm telling you what, in these last days, this is an age of the church when we need to stand tall. We need to celebrate communion today by saying, Jesus, I'm all yours. I'm all in. I will not bow down to what the world tries to tell me. I will totally subscribe to your Lordship. Can we do communion on that basis this morning? Are you with me? Come on. This wafer symbolically representing for us the body of Jesus that was nailed to the cross along with all of our sin and junk. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. My sin is disposed of. Let's receive the wafer. And then, of course, there is the grape juice that symbolically, powerfully reminds us of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Come on. Everybody say, I am redeemed. I am healed. Spirit, soul, and body. I am secure in Jesus Christ. I'm in love with the Lord. Come on. Can you say amen? Let's receive the cup. Oh, I feel so proud to be called a Christian this morning, and I pray that you have the very same sentiment as we go on our way from the house of God. Folks, we've had communion. We know who we are in Jesus Christ. And when anybody tries to steer you off track, say, no, I will not bow down. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that this service was so encouraging to you from the very beginning to the very end. Hey, if you live in the Regina area and you haven't been to one of our in-person Sunday services, we'd love to have you join us one of these Sundays very soon. If you're not able to join us and tune in online, we'll see you again right here next Sunday. Have a great week.